I have a message today, and it's called, Is There Not a Cause? Is There Not a Cause? You see, this week the enemy got me to question my ability to be a good pastor. I'm going to be transparent with you. Is that all right? All right. This, this week, the enemy got me thinking or, or, or pondering whether I have the ability to be a good pastor. You know, he's trying to tell me that I, that I push too hard, that I'm sometimes too demanding, and that I set the bar too high, and, and I expect too much. And that's the things that the enemy was, was telling me. And because of that, I don't have the ability to be a good pastor like this house needs. But, but as I took that to the Lord, he rebuked that thought. He, you know, he, rem he reminded me of how much I love you, how much I love this house and, and every person that walks into this house. He, he reminded me of my calling in every step, every difficult step it took to get here to this place today, okay? To be one of the pastors over this house, he reminded me of that calling. He just didn't call me at, in my mid-50s, late-50s for no good reason. He started to remind me of those things, amen? He reminded me of the vision that he placed in my heart, you know, and in my, in my spirit, I have this vision that I, you know, we just can't stop building. I told the prayer team the other night, we just can't stop building. We'll, we'll never stop building in this place. God is a builder. We'll build people. We build buildings. We build communities. We do whatever we have to do to build. That's what I'm called to do. I, I've never had any time in my life, you know, since I was a teenager where I will, really wasn't building something. And that's why, you know, God says we are builders, amen? amen? He reminded me of the time that we're living in. And we're living in a serious time. And he said, is there not a cause? Hallelujah. Stone. I will give you a sling. Yes. Yay, take the stone. Hallelujah. I will put my name on the stone that I give you. Put that stone with my name on it in the sling I give you and sling that stone. My name shall sink into the forehead of the enemy and pull him down. Pull him <laughs> down. Pull him down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 And he said, yes. There is a cause. There is a cause to what you're doing. I've called you here for this very reason. And he gave me a glimpse into many of your lives. He showed me your, your difficulties. He, he showed me the, some places where you're, you're hurt sometimes and, and your disappointment. And, and he showed me your spiritual battles. And he said, yes, there is a cause. Amen. But then he said this. He said, this is not a time to be soft. Amen. The flesh wants it soft. And he said, you cannot preach to the flesh. You have to preach Pass the flesh and preach into the spirit. Amen. He's called us to preach into the spirit. He showed me this verse. He said in Exodus 18, 20, it says, You shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work that they must do. So I'm telling you today. The body of Christ needs to bulk up, amen? The body of Christ needs to bulk up in the spirit, amen? We need to start to overcome those things that we've allowed to beset us and we've allowed to keep us back. When we worship, we have to give those things to Christ. We have to become overcomers. We need to repent for those things in our life that, that keep us from walking with Jesus the way that he's called us to walk with him. Those things that we hold on to, we 
We need to learn to repent for those things. We need to repent for the sins that keep us from Jesus. Amen. Jesus cannot be in our presence when we sin. When the Holy Spirit walks with us, then we get the Holy Spirit sometimes to actually sin with us. And we have to repent for that. The things that we say, the Holy Spirit is inside us. And he he says those things with us. And we have to learn to repent in Jesus' name. Name, you hear me? Repent. It says we need, we need to learn to be obedient. Obedient. The church has lost obedience to Christ. Amen. We've lost our reverence to God. This culture has lost their reverence to God and who he is. He is the great I am. Okay, we cannot be nonchalant about who God is. And the world wants to create this mindset in each and every one of us where we can put God wherever we want him. We can put him in whatever situation we have and we can use God however we feel to use God, but he's called us to revere him. He's called us to be obedient to his word, and he's calling us to repent for being nonchalant with the word of God, with the name of Jesus, amen? We're never just coming and going. We're always growing. We have to be always growing. We have to be always transforming each and every day, always getting stronger, And this is where it happens, folks. When we do these things, when we give God that place in our life, this is where it happens. This is where the sin is broken. This is where your character begins to change, amen? Can somebody give me a little volume? My voice is a little light today. I don't want to have to holler so much, but I want to hear what I'm saying, amen? This is where our lives are changed. This is where your marriage is are healed. This is where everything, our our relationships with our children are healed. Amen. This is where we become better mothers and better fathers. This is where we become better grandparents. This is where we become better stewards of our finances. This is when we see the victory is when it's not just in the coming and the going. It's in our everyday lives. We've learned to be obedient and we've learned to revere his name. Amen. 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 This is where healing begins. It's where miracles happen. I believe there's miracles all over this room. It's where hope comes alive. The enemy wants you to sit in this in this sanctuary and die from no hope. He doesn't want you to have hope. But every time you walk into the presence of God, there is hope to be had. There is change to be had. Amen. That's where life is restored. So I'm here for a reason. We're here for a reason. We're here together for a reason. We're here together for this season. Amen. And this is why we push. Okay, this is why we preach the truth so hard. This is, this is why we fight the battle, amen? His church will win. This church will, will win. When we put God in his rightful place and when we preach the truth, this church, this body will win, amen? But the problem is many pastors out there are still preaching to the flesh, They're still preaching to the flesh. They're preaching what you want to hear. They're afraid of the people. They're preaching what you want to hear. They're preaching preaching whatever it is that feeds the flesh. And we've got a country that has become religiously fat. The flesh has just gotten fat. You know, the spirit doesn't rule in the lives of many Christians anymore because the preachers are tickling the ears of their people, even the mega churches are preaching, some of them, to the flesh. They want to keep their mega church status. They want the people coming in and out. They know right now this culture says you can do whatever it is you want to do. So they're afraid to come and preach against that because they're afraid the people will leave their church and they'll lose the money that they bring into the church. This church can't be that church, amen? Feeding the flesh leads to destruction. It causes good people to rebel. It causes brave people to fear. 
to live in fear. It, it causes strong people to retreat and back off when the enemy pushes. They back off. They were strong once, but now they're backing off. Amen. It causes passionate people to do nothing. Does it sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? I believe America has be, been feeding their flesh long enough. It's been leading to destruction. Amen. Pete, you look serious today. I, I hope you're ready for the fight. Amen. Amen. He gave me a thumbs up. That's why we're encouraging a fasted lifestyle. A fasted lifestyle. God spoke to our hearts during this last 21 days where we are going to start to kill the flesh even more and more in our lives. Amen. God did amazing things in these 21 days. He spoke to a lot of people. He touched a lot of hearts. He changed some thinking. Amen. And one of the things that we need to do as a body of Christ is we need to say, God, we will no longer feed the flesh so that our spirit has to take second place in our lives. We'll no longer fulfill the desires of the flesh. What does that mean? Well, it means, it means quite frankly that when you're eating, you will never fulfill that desire of the flesh. Okay? You'll eat enough to keep you alive. You'll eat enough to give you the energy to serve the Lord. Amen? You'll, you'll eat enough that, that you can be strong ready to serve, but you'll never fulfill that desire to fill up and stuff, you know. Oh, I'm stuffed. Well, we do that way too much. All we do is fulfill the desires of the flesh. The cell phone. The cell phone. That's the flesh too. Some of us got to learn not to fulfill the desire of the flesh with our cell phones. Amen? Amen. Amen. Some of us got to turn the TV off. You know, our flesh wants the TV on. Our flesh wants our favorite program. Our flesh wants the news. Some of you need to uh, fast the news, okay? No longer sitting in front of the news for hours upon hours, feeding the flesh. Take the time to feed the spirit. But when we push that flesh down, that's when the spirit is able to rise up. That's when we get strong. That's when we see these changes. We come into this place week after week after week, <laughs> praising God, begging him for change in our lives. But we go out and we just fulfill the desire of the flesh afterward. We're going to live a fasted lifestyle in this place. Are you, are you ready? Are you all ready? I, I, come on. Are you all ready? Some of you are saying that'll be hard. Yes, it will be hard. Amen? It will be hard. You can pass the test. You can pass the test. We're going to learn to sacrifice. When we learn to sacrifice, that's when we, when we see that portal of God open up. Just like Brother Don said, you know, as long as we continue to sacrifice ourselves, not fulfilling the flesh, sacrifice ourselves before the Lord, giving him honor, that's when we see the changes, the victories in our lives. Amen? Sometimes pastors get, 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 get uh, sad even preaching victory in the lives of people because some people sit in the church body and they just don't get it. They say, God, you know, I, I've been coming to church. I've been doing this and I don't feel that victory in my life. Well, it says, seek ye first the kingdom and then all of these things will be added unto you. Seek after him. Put him in his rightful place. That's when he will do the work. That's when he will bring you to that place of victory that you've been so desiring. Amen. Your outcome is directly connected to your commitment to the word, your prayer life, your faithfulness to the church as his bride, your personal sacrifice, amen? It's connected to how you speak and how you think. What are you speaking in your life? Your, your victory is directly connected to that. What are you thinking? Okay, do you have a strong work ethic? Are you willing to work hard? Your, 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 your success is directly connected to those things, making wise decision. And when we're in all those places of prayer and connection with God, that's when we see the wisdom of God when we make the wise 
wise decisions. Amen? The flesh wants you to be lazy with these things. It wants you to be loose. Amen? It, so we must bulk up. We must train. We must work out. And we must get strong. Everybody with me? Okay, good. I'm ready to start the sermon now. I have a cold today. You probably noticed. Okay. I, ha I said cold, not COVID. Okay. I, I am keeping my distance today, but it's just a cold. I don't want to get you sick. All right. I'm going to preach through it. There's nothing that's going to keep me from preaching through it. Amen. All right. Father, I pray right now. Lord, they thought I was kidding about this sermon, but I pray, God, now as we get into your word, that you'll anoint the ears in this place to hear it. God, that you'll move in the lives of your people. And God, that somebody's watching a live stream. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. I'm easily distracted. <laughs> First Samuel 17, folks. It says, now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were, and were gathered at Socah, which belongs to Judah. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with the valley between them. You see, the Philistines have come up against God's people. And before they come through the valley, they stand on the other side. And they send this giant out, this big, huge guy named Goliath out. And every day he would come out twice. For 40 days, Goliath would come out and he was about... Nine feet tall, I think the Bible said, and he carried, he carried armor and spears and, and weapons, you know, that weighed more than some of us weigh. So as he came out, he would, he would come out and criticize, and he, and he would uh, terrorize the, the people of God with, their, with, the, with words, and he would challenge them and ask for, for somebody to come out and fight him. And whoever gets killed, you know, the Philistines, he says, I'll kill your guys, and the Philistines will, will take God. God's people and put them into bondage. And, and this happened uh, every day, twice a day. But every time Goliath came out, the army of God, they would, they would back off. They would get afraid and terror and they would go back to their holes and, and just sit there. And Goliath would stand there unchallenged. And there was a, there was a little boy young man named David who was tending sheep. He really wasn't old enough to be in the army and be out there that day. But his dad had sent him to the battlefront to take his brothers. All of his brothers were there to take his brothers some food. And when he got there, he heard Goliath challenging these men. And here's what he said. He said, he said, then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You see, Goliath was coming out and defying the armies of the living God and directly defying God in the process. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here, and with whom have you left these few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And how many times have you drawn up battle for the Lord and somebody that's supposed to be standing next to you will start to criticize you and call you f prideful because you want to fight a battle for God, amen? Because you want to do something that's right, people will come against you. It happens all of the time, amen? And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he, turned from his, then he turned from him and toward another, and he said the same thing. Is there not a cause? You see, David couldn't believe that no man would accept Goliath's challenge. There was so much at stakes. 
All the families of Israel were, ext- were at stake. All of the houses, the, their livelihood, everything was at stake. It was like a winner-take-all situation. He couldn't believe that there was no man that would stand up against this, gi- against this giant. And he said, is there not a cause? And David looked past Goliath's imposing size, and he knew that there was something more important than running back to a foxhole and allowing himself to be intimidated like the rest of the army that day. He knew that a decision had to be made and it had to be made quickly. And he didn't consider the size of the giant. He didn't consider how many people were standing behind the giant in the Philistine army. He didn't consider the fact that that every member of the Israel army was, was afraid of this man. He didn't consider any of that. And he took it upon himself himself because he knew there was a cause greater than any giant. All of the families were at stake. They would lose it all. The purpose and plans of God were at stake. It wasn't just God's people being taunted by an enemy. It was actually two kingdoms in battle. It was the kingdom of God and it was the kingdom of Satan at battle there. And David recognized that. He knew that there was an importance of the time. I I think he probably knew that there was billions of souls at stake. If nothing happened, if nothing occurred, and the Philistine took this army, I believe believe he knew that many would perish and not have the opportunity to know Jesus Christ. Amen? The enemy shouted his threats again. He shouted threats of intimidation. He called all the men out. He he shouted lies at them. He was fear-mongering. Then David said this to the Philistine. He said, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. You may have CNN and network news on your side. You may have Facebook and Twitter on your side. You may have some public support on your side. You may have fooled them, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. You may have had your way for a while. You may have manipulated some. You may have been causing division in this country with these men here because of the fear. You may have done all that. You may have been throwing your weight around and pushing and shoving and scaring people, but your time is up. That's what what he said. He said, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take from you your head and this day I will give you the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hands, amen, and fight David did. He picked up his sling, just like we heard, and he fought and he put a stone in the forehead of that enemy. And this is the role of Christ-minded people today, folks. This is our role today in this time is to preserve the cause, standing God's ground, writing history. America's destiny is being challenged just as old Israel was challenged on that day, folks. Spiritual giants are trying to abort God's plan in this country. They're trying to frustrate the plans of God, amen? They're intimidating his people and pushing them and lying to them. And God is calling on some people, some cause-minded, Holy Ghost-filled people, okay, that are gonna willing to push the flesh down, that are willing to allow the Spirit to rise up in them, that aren't afraid of what other people think. He's looking for those cause-minded people that have the vision for what God wants to do in their lives and in their communities, that aren't, that aren't tired, that aren't, that aren't going to make excuses for not doing it because there's been too many excuses. He's too big. He's too big. Can you look at the size of him? I wonder what kind of excuses they passed around for 40 days, twice a day, as they ran to the little hole. All of them together in unison. You picture that? Everything the enemy would want. 
No wonder they did it for 40 days. They could have went and took them. They were having fun toying with them. God is calling some people out, folks. He's calling people to be spiritual giant killers. He's calling people to be destiny preservers. Am I talking to anybody in this place today? Is anybody here? Is anybody willing to take up the cause? Amen? I met a man named Tony at the Volusia Mall a few years ago. Can you put that picture up, Tim? Let me get a drink. You remember Tony, honey? We had a good time that day. We met Tony at the mall, and um, he had that hat on. It said World War II vet. Leave the picture up for a few minutes. And um, we got to talking with him. Just wanted to show some respect and honor because there's not many of those guys around anymore. I don't know if there is any, period. Okay. Tony was like two months from his 100th birthday. Remember? Yeah, he was 99 and two months, and, and he had it all upstairs. And we started to question him just because, you know, wanted to hear the stories and everything. And, and like I said, show him some honor. And Tony, you know, he, he started talking about why he served, you know, pride for his country, how his family, you know, was, was prideful of their country. And he, he even talked about God and, you know, how God was was over us, and, and he just, he, he, his face, was, you know, just lit up as he was talking. Because I'm not sure many people took the time to go over and, and speak to this. This was about four years ago. I don't know if Tony's still around or not, but he was in pretty good health. And, and you know, you could see his pride of serving his country and, and you know, of God and his country. And still, World War II, 80 years ago, almost, and he's still just full of pride for that. Amen. He started to talk about D-Day. He wasn't there that day, but he, he assisted and he helped out with that operation. D-Day was on my wife's birthday back in 1944. How old were you? <laughs> you were 10? <sighs> you know, and, and these guys, if you could picture D-Day... When I was in the service, I, I was an assault boat coxswain, okay? And what that was is we were on a ship, and the, and the ship would ballast down, and out of the back of the ship, all these boats would come out. You've probably seen them on the war movies. They were flat-bottomed, and they had a ramp in the front, and they had a, they had a Navy guy, you know, steering from this box, and he'd have to drive straight in through the surf, and he'd go to the beach, He'd lower that ramp down, and all those jarheads, Marines, would come running out. Amen? They would come running out. And you know, I read on D-Day that the average lifespan of each one of those Marines was 11 seconds after they ran out. And then, and then you'd have to back the boat out of the surf straight out. Um, I, I can imagine it was pretty intense that day on D-Day, you know. Um, if you've ever studied it out, you, you see how many bodies, how many people are actually killed on D-Day. Just defending our nation. Defending God and our nation. That's why they did it that day. They were defending God and they were defending our nation back in 1944. Amen? And just like those war heroes of that day, we're really facing our own D-Day now. We really are. It's, it's not as deadly for us, but it's deadly for our children. It's deadly for our generations. We are facing our own D-Day here, folks. It's a war over freedom, okay? It's a war over eternal destinies. I'm here to tell you, it's a war over our family. And we need some spiritual soldiers that are willing to, to storm the gates of hell. I'm just telling you, you know, I, I, I might sound like I'm sounding a war cry, but folks, the only people that are going to do that are the people that put God where he belongs, are the people that are God chasers, that are chasing after God. If we don't become fully committed to God, if we don't seek him, 
him first, then nobody will be there to storm those shores. Nobody will be there to win that battle. And, and our country will continue to go somewhere that we all pray that it won't. And we can just stand back and we can continue to pray just like we do in our own lives. We can continue to pray for the things we want so bad, but we're not willing to chase after them. Amen. We see God being taunted daily in our land, cursed in the name of false gods. His word and his law are mocked every day on the news. And some of us have our nose into the news while we watch him mock God and watch him mock what, what God wants to do in this country. I'm here to ask you, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? You see, we must be like my friend Tony he loved freedom. That's why he gave himself to do that. That's why those Marines did that that day. And I don't want to raise this big, huge emotion. I want you to get this set in your spirit that you're willing to be like them. You don't have to storm the shores like they did. You'll have more than 11 seconds, I hope. But we need to get that same bravery, that same intense desire to, to fulfill what God wants us to do. We're fighting a different enemy we're using different weapons, but it's equally as real. It's equally as real as World War II was, and the stakes are even greater. The stakes are greater than what it was that day. You see, like David, we must stare down this giant, the giant of immorality. We need to be some, some spiritual giant killers, the giant of drugs, of abortion, the breakdown of the family, the fatherless children. We need to come against that. The gender confusion that's in this country. We need to come against that. We need some giant killers. The critical race theory that's going through this country and through the schools. We need some giant killers. We need to get excited and passionate about changing what they're teaching our children. But if we can't get there first, how can we be passionate? How can we change anything if, if we don't change ourselves first? Amen? We need to get strong against this cancel culture and this just do as you please culture, man. It isn't right. It takes God and just shoves him to the side. And he's not going to put up with that much longer. He, we, he needs some people that are willing to stand up and come against it. The socialism. I threw that one in there. The church can't miss this appointed time, folks. We can't miss it. We need to be the fighters. We need to be the fighters. Our politicians are not going to fight that battle. The church, God's people, need to be the fighters. We need to be the one charging. Amen? Amen. Amen. We need to be the builders. But pastor, what can I do? You can do a lot. You can do a lot. I saw Robert walking through this place putting the connection cards. And, and that's just one small thing of what you can do to make this body of Christ move forward. There's a lot of things we can do, but the most important thing we can do is get right with God. Every area of our lives, repent for the things that, we've, that we have to repent for. We need to get right with God. God showed me. There's many of you that need to get right, that need to repent. God showed me this. He wants to heal your lives. We have to get right. Amen? Amen. That's why we sacrifice. That's why, that's why we seek him first, because when all that happens, everything else comes together. And then we start to see what it is that we really desire in our lives. Amen? We change our lives first, and then we embrace the cause. Then the cause is challenged. Then the cause, you know, then, then all those things that come against the cause is challenged. Amen? Amen? It says in Matthew 16, 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter took that serious. Peter was all in. 
When he heard that, he was all in. And, and Peter led 11 guys that, that stormed the beaches, the 11 guys that traveled that area and, and, and grew and came against what the enemy wanted to squash down. Peter did it. And now we are that rock. Amen. We are that rock. Picture yourself as the rock that God wants to build his church on. Amen. We are standing on the rock of Jesus Christ. But we are the rock. And we need to be strong like a rock is strong. Amen. We're builders. And we build in the name of Jesus. We're going to build those people. We're going to build his church. Amen. We won't back down or we won't stop. He's taken us too far. He's taken us too far. If you're in this house and you've been in this house a while, he took us out of that building on 13th Street and he put us in this building. And the enemy tried to stop us from building in this building, okay? We, we were, God gave us the cash to buy this building outright, amen? We bought this building and we had a work to do in it and the enemy tried to stop us from doing it, amen? They put stop work orders on us. They sent the police over to stop us. There was nothing gonna stop us. We just said, hey, you can put that sign on the door, but we're gonna build, amen? There's nothing that says in the Bible that we have to follow the law of ungodly people, ungodly leaders. You all can go to Romans 8, go wherever you want, but there's nothing in the Bible that says we have to follow the law of ungodly leaders. They might want to take their people to hell, but we're not taking, we're not taking people to hell. We're, we're going to empty out hell, amen? Amen. We have a cause, so we're bold. We're not afraid. As hard as the enemy works, we're going to work harder, amen? As hard as the enemy works, we're going to work harder, amen? Come on, I don't feel good and I can shout it. As hard as the enemy works, we're going to work harder, amen? We're going to, amen, hallelujah. We have a cause and we have an angel army that's backing us up. We have, we have the God of this universe that is backing us up. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm almost done. It's gone quick this morning. When I think about this region, I remember about this city. And I talked about this city a couple months ago. In 1970s, El Malanga, Guatemala, was idolatrous and economically depressed. Does anybody remember this story? A couple of you are paying attention? Okay. You don't remember the story, honey? Huh? You sit on the front row. You remember, Val? You don't remember the story? Hmm. Uh, you all need to pay more attention in church for crying out loud. In the 1970s, okay, that's not too far removed, right? Most of us in this room, well, I'm glad most of us weren't born in this room. I'm glad we have young people in this room, young adults and all that. But many of us were born in the 1970s. This town in, in Guatemala, it was idolatrous and depressed. Alcoholism was all over the place. There was adultery there was witchcraft, there was sin everywhere. Poverty and violence were normal. Are you getting this? Is it, is it coming back? Families suffered terrible due to the depravity that was, that was in that city. It was bad. Just Central America is where Guatemala is, amen? And the gospel didn't prosper. And then in 1974, a series of prayer vigils began. Might have been the way center down there said, we're going to have a 21-day fast and prayer. Amen? I think they called themselves the way center. We said, we're going to have 21-day fast and prayer. And a, re a remnant recognized the time. Okay? They recognized the challenge and the giants that were there in that city that came against their families. 
okay, their, their government. They came against all of that. They recognized that. They knew there was a time. And God began to move. And deliverance and healing started to break through. As people started to pray, as they started to clean their lives up, deliverance and healing started to break through. Even during some of the worship, even during the preaching of the word, even during the laying out of the hands, people's lives were changed. Crutches were thrown to the side. Wheelchairs were thrown up. I'm telling you, it happened. You can read it. You can Google. Salvation's everywhere. There was 20,000 people in that area, in that town at that time in 1974. These revivals broke out. 90% of the people in that city gave their lives to Christ over the next coming months. 90%. Okay, 20,000 people is just like our, our region around us right here. By the way, if you live in the Heights, we're coming after you. Amen? We're coming after you. After we get to Heights, we're going to Horseheads and, and down there near West Side neighborhood. So if you leave, live down in any of those areas, you better watch out. Amen? The revival impacted every area of life. Families started to prosper. Okay, education started to happen properly. The businesses started to grow. The, the money started to come in for, for God's people, amen? I'm telling you, Google it. Even the produce, there changed. Now, you remember in this? Okay, they were blessed. It's now nicknamed Guatemala's Vegetable Garden. You see, what happened here is this place did not produce anything, and all of a sudden, they have three harvests per year. Not just one harvest, Three harvests per year, okay, of these crops. They had five-pound beets that were being harvested out of the ground there. God took the ground, amen. He started to harvest these five-pound beets. They started to harvest carrots bigger than my arm, amen. They started to, to harvest cabbage as big as basketballs. They were blessed. They exported it everywhere, God prospered the people there. God prospered the land. The drug abuse was gone. Okay, all of the sin was gone. The human trafficking was gone. The prostitution was gone. Everything disappeared. The power of God changed things. The crime, it all disappeared. Google it. God sent a revival to that people. Because they decided to become giant killers. They made a decision in their life, in their heart, that you know what? These people, they might not be praying for it, but there was a small remnant that said, I'm going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to come. We're going to give ourselves. We're going to change this area. God will change it. He'll use us to change this area. But the most important thing, he changed their families. He changed their own lives. He did what he said he was going to do. He healed people. He prospered people. Oh, you know? In 1991, 4,200 men descended on the University of Colorado here in the United States. It was Promise Keepers. Anybody ever heard of Promise Keepers back in the 90s? Amen. Anybody ever go to Promise Keepers? A couple. Amen. I went to one in Baltimore. It was amazing. Men got together all over this country. They came in and they went and they said, you know what? We, we are going to be promise keepers. We know there's a cause. We know there's a need. And we're promising to meet this need. Amen. It grew and it grew. And, and, and in 99, I think there was a, a million men in Washington at, at Promise Keeper. They filled the Washington Mall area. All those men came from all over the country making a promise to God to change their people, their families, to change their lives. But you know what? It fizzled out. It fizzled out. All of the promise keepers, they, they ended up just getting pushed to the side. The, the giant got bigger and bigger and bigger. 
And then people have become afraid, and that's only 22 years ago. People have become afraid to take on the giant. It's time for us as a, as a church, as a people of God, and not just as this church, but of every church in this area, it's time for us to slay that giant in our own backyard. We're letting Satan run loose in our own yards. It's time for us as a church. How do I do that? Start seeking God more each and every day. Start seeking him like it was your last day. Amen? You all know we are not made for this world. We're made for the next world. So you give it all you got. Give it all you got. Hi, honey. How are you? Yay. Yay. I haven't seen you in a while. You're beautiful. Yeah, love, love. Yeah. Hi, honey. Are you having trouble sleeping in your crib? Are you sleeping on the floor now? Huh? Is she sleeping on the floor? Yeah, she won't get in her crib. She's hiding from mom. How are you? It's good to see you. That was messed up. Folks, we need some promise keepers. Okay? I'm done. We need some promise keepers. Our families need some promise keepers. Our children, they need some promise keepers. She needs to grow up knowing who she is in God. Amen? She, she needs to know, grow up knowing how much God cares about her and loves her. Amen? Okay, she needs to have godly influence around, around her. Amen? She needs to go to a school. <laughs> She's, she's just like her dad. Look at Yeah. She needs to go to a school where she's going to be taught what, what we're supposed to teach our children. Amen? Amen. Yeah? I'd love to pick you up and preach with you, but I don't want you to catch my cold, honey. But I just want to worship, Mom. I just want to worship and you won't let me. Hallelujah. Those babies, those babies need. She's being drawn. She's being drawn to God. Those, those babies need us. Okay, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Amen? Is there not a cause? Who is willing to transform their lives for the cause? Amen? Who's really willing to take up the cause like David did and, and like Tony did? Who's willing to do that? Is there anybody in this house that's willing to do that today? Is there anybody in this house that is, that is willing to honor God the way, the way that we're supposed to honor God? Give him that position in our lives. Is there anybody here that rever reveres God? Is, is there anybody here that hates sin, that doesn't want sin to control them anymore? Is there anybody here? Is there anybody here? Is there anybody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? That's the first step. Is there anybody here? Most of us in this room, we've made that decision. Amen? Amen. I want to give you an opportunity. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want to know him, and you want to start seeking after him. And you want to start to be this destiny preserver, this giant slayer. If you want to do that in your life, but you need to know Jesus Christ first, I want you to raise your hand in this place. If that's you, just raise your hand. That's all. Hallelujah. Everybody's good. Praise God. Everybody's good. Everybody's good. Stand to your feet with me. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Let me remind you, each and every one of you is a cause. 
Each and every one of you, Jesus went to the cross because you're a cause. Amen. Amen. God loves you so much and you're a cause. We want to shift. If there's anybody here that wants to spend a little time with Jesus, I'm just going to open this up and I'm going to ask Pastor David to pray after we do this. Uh, worship the Lord a little bit more because we're not done yet, but he's going to pray and release you. But if there's anybody here that wants to, that wants to step out and come to the altars, the altars are open, and I know she wants to come. She can go. Let her go. If you're there, you're, if she's there, you're there with her. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We love you. Altars open.